Well, good morning, everybody. Welcome to Emmanuel Baptist Church. It's good to see you all. Welcome to all of our friends and family members and everybody else who's in town for Cedarville's homecoming weekend. It's good to see some new faces and some old faces who, who used to be around but are, are back. In our upstairs bathroom at home, we have this old cross stitch. I don't know what, it, is it a picture or if it's just a pattern? I don't know what you call an old cross stitch, but it's this thing hanging on our bathroom wall and it's upstairs, it's one that all the kids use. Um, I think it's something that Emily's mom made a long time ago. They used to hang up in their bathroom when Emily was a little girl. Um, but it says this, and I don't know if we have a picture of that up there, but and you might not be able to read it. It's kind of small. That's, that's the actual cross stitch. But it says, don't forget to brush your teeth. Don't forget to comb your hair. Don't forget to wash your hands. And don't forget to wear a smile. It doesn't really go with our bathroom decor up there because we kind of have this old-fashioned American heritage kind of thing up there. But we got this goofy little cross stitch up there. Um, but like I said, it's part of our, a little bit of our family history, something Emily's mom made. Our little girls like it, so we keep it up. And it's just a silly little thing that reminds us that sometimes we need that reminder for the simple things. Wash your hands, brush your teeth, wear a smile. Isn't it embarrassing at times when you realize that you've gone all day without brushing your teeth? Am I the only one who's ever done that? Right. I'm glad you guys weren't around my house until 4 o'clock yesterday afternoon. Um, but, but sometimes we need reminders, right? It's all the time we need reminders. You know, remember to take out the trash. Tonight is trash night for our part of the, the city. You need to remember to take your vitamins, take your medicine. Remember to get your oil changed every 3,000 miles. Remember your password and your logins. Oh my goodness, how many of those do we have? Don't forget your mom's birthday, especially those milestone ones. Don't forget your anniversary. Right? When I first got married, my wife wanted to make sure that I didn't forget our anniversary, so she stole my Bible, had it rebound, and had our anniversary printed right on the front. And she thought, if I ever forgot our anniversary, she would know that I wasn't reading my Bible. So, so you know, kind of served dual purpose there. So why do I bring this up? Why do I talk about reminders? Well, this is, as was said, the, the first Sunday of the month, and it's the time that we as a church come together to celebrate communion, to remember what Jesus did for us. Remembering how he died on the cross for us, how he shed his blood and took the punishment for our sins. And as you know, those of you who have been around EBC for a while, what Jesus did on the cross is never far from our teaching here. It's because of his death, burial, and resurrection that we do anything. It's at the heart of everything that we do. It's the reason we exist as a church. It's the reason that we come together the first day of every week. It's the reason why throughout the week we have Bible studies and fellowship times and do something like Operation Christmas Child. We need to remember what Jesus did on the cross for us. And so even though that what Jesus did for us is foundational to everything we do and are and believe as a church, Sometimes we forget. We still need to remember. And when we do forget, we tend to put our focus and our emphasis on the wrong thing. We forget, and then we start thinking that church is all about the programs. We forget, and we think that church is all about the music. We forget, and we think that the reason that we come 
is all about the relationships or the fellowship that we have. We forget and we think more about how this hour and a half is going to make us feel than how we are supposed to respond to Jesus and what he did for us. We forget. And Jesus knew that we would be forget. He knew that we were forgetful people, which is why he gave us something to help us remember. And that's why on the first Sunday of every month, we come together to celebrate the Lord's Supper. We come together and celebrate communion. And we take communion because Jesus said to do this in remembrance of him. So let's pray together. And then I just want to share a few thoughts as we uh, approach the communion table today. Um, And then we can do that as a church family. So pray with me, please. Our great God and Heavenly Father, thank you for this morning. Thank you that you loved us so much that you shed your blood and died on the cross for us. And that you have given us a means by which we can remember what you did so that we don't drift, so we don't don't go off task, we don't go off focus, but that we constantly come back to you. And so God, I pray that this morning will be a morning where we will be reminded that we will remember what you did. So God, help me to, to get out of the way of the truths that you have to teach us so that we all, myself included, can fix our eyes upon you and what you've done. So we thank you and we praise you, Father, in the name of Jesus. Amen. So typically our our first Sunday of each month, our communion Sunday, is sort of a one-off type Sunday. What we mean by that is no matter what topic or series that we're working on, We often take the first Sunday and we pause on that topic, we pause on that series, and we do something that helps us focus and turn our attention solely on the work of the cross, so we can be reminded of what Jesus did. Sometimes God works it out so that the series that we're doing and the passage of scripture that we're in actually fits perfectly with communion. And, and, and the, those two things sort of blend together and happen at the same time. Well, today isn't quite that, but it's pretty darn close. Um, if you've been with us at all for the last six weeks or so, you know that we're about a third of the way through our series on the book of Ephesians. Um, and we've gotten through these first two chapters, and we haven't spent nearly the amount of time that each of those two chapters requires for us to really dig totally deep into them and get all the truth and goodness that are are in those. But we spent a good amount of time uh, being able to focus on on what these these parts are about. And if you you recall, what we said is uh, chapters 1 through 3 is really about enjoying God's triumph. What God has done, what he is doing, and what he will do in Christ by the Spirit. To restore and reclaim all things. It's about celebrating what God has done. And that's where we still are in our series. Where we've just finished chapter 2. If we were to continue on, we would start chapter 3. But instead, we're going to pause. And we're just going to reflect on a little bit of how these first two chapters. And specifically, the latter part of chapter 2 that we went over last week how that fits with what Christ has done for us and how that fits in this idea of remembering, this idea of communion. So throughout these chapters, Paul emphasizes that salvation is a work of God alone. In chapter 1, we heard that he chose us, he adopted us, he predestined us before the beginning of time, 
which, you know, just as a side note, we certainly could not have earned our salvation if it was known before we were even born, right? So salvation was accomplished on the basis of God's grace alone through faith alone. And Ephesians 2, 8, and 9 makes that abundantly clear. They're reading out of the New Living Translation. It says that God saved you by his grace when you believed. And you can't take credit for this. It is a gift of God. Salvation is not a reward for the good things we have done, so none of us can boast about it. No amount of good works or human efforts or religious activity will ever be enough for us to earn our salvation. You can't do that. We are all scarred by our sins. So whether they're sins of commission, the ones that we actually commit and do, whether knowingly or not, or whether they're sins of omission, the sins that we, the things that we sh- knew we should have done but we chose not to do, we are scarred by those sins. And our sins have separated us from God, rightly so. As chapter 2, verse 12 says, that we are without hope in this world. And as we study in the book of Titus earlier this summer, chapter 3, verses 5 through 6 says that we were saved by his mercy, not by works of righteousness. So there's God's mercy that's keeping us from the punishment that we so rightly deserve. And there's God's grace that is giving us a blessing that we woefully don't deserve. And as a result, anybody who puts their faith in Jesus, as most of us know, and as we learned last week, anybody who puts their faith in Jesus, we're all part of the same spiritual family. That really is the emphasis of the latter half of chapter 2. So let's look once again at verses 11 through 13. So if you have your Bibles, please open it up. Turn to Ephesians chapter 2. And we're going to look at a variety of verses starting in verse 11. We'll go all the way through 17. It's a little bit, a little bit today. So let's read together. Not out loud. I'll read it. But uh, you can read along with me, uh, verses 11 through 13. Starting here in verses 11 and 12. It says, Therefore remember that formerly you who were Gentiles by birth and called uncircumcised by those who call themselves the circumcised, which is done in the body by human hands, remember that at that time you were separate from Christ, excluded from citizenship in Israel and foreigners to the covenants of the promise without hope, and without God in this world. Prior to coming to Jesus, the Jewish people considered Gentiles to be unclean and and inferior. They call them, you know, the uncircumcised, those dirty, uncircumcised Philistine type things, the the Gentiles, the, the ones who didn't have the promise, the mark of God's people. And just like most of us in this room, since I don't know everybody's background, but just like most of us in the the church at Ephesus would have been made up of primarily Gentiles, non-Jews. Church at Ephesus that was there on the western side of Turkey. So in this section, in these couple verses, Paul explains how the gospel extends hope, promise, and relationship with God to Jews and Gentiles alike. See, in here, Paul provides five negative realities of people whose lives are are those who don't know Christ. There are five negative realities in it. First, that there's separation. The relationship and love that they knew in their hearts did not previously exist. Second, before coming to Christ, there was no connection with the people of God. They were considered foreigners. They were inferior. They were unclean. 
Third, they were not part of God's promises. God's Old Testament covenants were made with the Jewish people, not with the Gentiles. And so the Gentiles, you and me, we were left out of those previous arrangements. Fourth, they had no hope prior to knowing Christ. And Paul used this phrase in one other place, and that's when he described when believers die, the surviving believers do not grieve as others who have no hope. And the fifth thing that he talks about is that they were without God in this world. And so these five things, uh, along with the conditions mentioned in verse 11 there, offer a list of reasons which had excluded the people of the church there and excluded unbelievers from God's family prior to salvation. So all these drawbacks described here in in these two verses imply that Paul's Gentile readers had been far from God. But in verse 13, everything changes. So why don't you turn to that for me there in verse 13. It says, but now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ. That's the game changer right there, the blood of Christ. In verse 13, Paul declares that everything changes with Jesus. And I think what stands out here is is Paul's emphasis regarding the blood of Christ. He used this phrase only one other time in all of his writings. Uh, In one of his letters to the church at Corinth, he used it in reference to the communion element. And we'll look at that a little bit later. But the writer of Hebrews uses it too. In Hebrews... Verses 9, verse 14 says, How much more then will the blood of Christ cleanse our consciences from acts that lead to death so that we may serve the living God? Peter also uses it in his letter. And he says this about the blood of Christ. In verses, chapter 1, verses 18 and 19. That's on the next slide. It says, For you know that this is not with perishable things, such as silver and gold, that you are redeemed, but with the precious blood of Christ, without blemish or defect. So it's the blood of Christ that changes things. And that's in part what we are here to remember today through communion. The blood of Jesus makes peace. And that's a great thing. I want to read with me verses 13 through 17. It says, But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility By abolishing the law and commandments expressed in the ordinances, that he might create in himself one new man in place of the two, so making peace, and might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. And he came and preached peace to you who are far off, and peace to those who are near. As I said, the blood of Jesus makes peace. So in in these few verses, Paul gives the answer as to what will unify people. So what will actually bring us all peace? And it's not an endless search for some common ground or 
or some common good, or, or for us to all of a sudden become colorblind. Peace on earth and peace with each other comes from God in heaven through Jesus. And it's only through that vertical reconciliation with God that lasting peace can be found in the community created by Jesus himself. Speaking of this very reconciliation, Paul says three things about about the way that Jesus and his blood can bring peace. The first there is in chapter 14, or in verse 14, sorry. It says, Jesus is our peace. Jesus doesn't just promise peace. He is peace. In a way that it's so much better than all the peace treaties ever signed, where enemies come and they lay down their arms, yet walk away still being enemies in their hearts. Jesus came and united all people to himself. He didn't just say, you know, you're going to stop being angry with each other or upset or or hostile toward each other. He says, no, we're going to take away all those things and we're going to make you into one. He came to break down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in the ordinances. The thing that divided Jew and Gentile, specifically the law of Moses, was replaced by Christ himself. The church of Jesus Christ is not a Jewish church or a Gentile church, or a Baptist church, or a Presbyterian church. It's it's not a black church or a white church. It's not an Eastern or a Western church. It is Jew and Gentile, a brand new, completely different race that finds life in the Spirit and in peace in Christ. So Jesus is our, is peace. But the second thing that, of how Jesus makes peace is found there in verse 15, is that Jesus made, or he grants peace. He procures peace. Through his death on the cross, he accomplished two things that, that granted peace. First, he destroyed the dividing wall a symbol of the barrier that stood between Jews and Gentiles. And second, he created a new man. And this is what what Paul says made peace. If you were part of our our share groups on on Sunday nights, I kind of used this example as I was thinking about this, of of how God created a, a new man rather than just people coming together. It's not like he took an Ohio State fan and a Michigan fan and brought them together and say, all right, now you guys are together and you're going to root against the SEC. You know, because we do that in bowl season. You know, when, as a Michigan fan, I root for Ohio State when they're playing Alabama. Or any other team. I don't know. Clemson. Um, You know, because, you know, I want the Big Ten to win. But that doesn't mean that there's peace between Michigan and Ohio State, because everybody knows Michigan's better, right? Okay, they haven't been for the last 19 years, but that's beside the point. Um, Go blue. Um, Instead, it's not just the two enemies come together for against one common enemy. That's not peace. What Jesus does is he brings these two enemies together and saying, you know what? You're no longer going to be part of your own schools. You're going to be a whole brand new different school. And you're not rooting against anybody, but you are rooting for Jesus. You have unity in this new identity, this new identity that is Jesus. It's not your old person. It's not your old school. It's this brand new thing. 
And those who were enemies are now one because they have a bond in Jesus himself. And on the cross, when Jesus died in place of his people, he made peace for this one new man. As Paul says in Romans 6, verses 3 through 6, those who have been made alive in Christ were also crucified with him. And those who died in him have his peacemaking life. You know, no matter how much they fought in life, you won't hear any arguments from your parents or grandparents or great-grandparents when they're dead and buried next to each other in the cemetery. You know, Gettysburg National Cemetery has both Union and Confederate soldiers buried in it. Because in death, all arguments cease. And this is how Jesus procured peace. By his death, we die. And through his life, we live. And it's in that death of his, where we have died also, he procured this one new man reconciled with God. We died to ourselves, and we live in him. As Romans eleven thirty two 32 puts it, God bound everyone over to disobedience and death so that he might have mercy on all. Therefore, he unifies people from every nation by means of giving them the same spiritual experience of death and resurrection. And as a result, therefore, in churches where the gospel of Christ is taught, here at EBC, those who were once enemies people who may have never associated with each other for some reason or another, it's through his death and his life that we can have the power to love one another, that we have the ability to forgive one another, that we have the ability to serve one another because we all have our shared experience of God's grace. So Jesus is peace, Jesus grants peace, and then the third thing that Jesus does is that he proclaims peace. And that's found there in verse 17. And Paul says, he came and preached peace to those who are far away and those who are near. See, the very common message of the New Testament is, are, are two things. To remind believers of the grace that they have received in Christ and two, to live in light of their new position in Christ. We're to be reminded that we've received grace and we're reminded to live in that grace. And that's how Paul responds to conflicts and in, in challenges in all the churches. That He wrote that in 1 Corinthians the problems that they were facing. He wrote about that in the book of Colossians, so the problems that that church there was facing. And he writes about that here in, in, in Ephesians, so the problems that the church at Ephesus had between Jews and Gentiles. See, our resurrected Lord still speaks. He proclaims peace by the Spirit and through the church. Through you and me. And in the gospel, Jesus is speaking. He is calling, beckoning, urging irreconcilable sinners to be reconciled to God and to, to be reconciled to one another. In truth, one of the reasons why we continue to preach the gospel is because 
Christ, by his spirit, is speaking his word to us. On those same lines, Christians with different backgrounds need the gospel to remind us of the unity that we have in Christ. And so we come to communion to remind us of all that Christ has done and to remind us of the unity that we have in him. So the the communion table is a unifying table. So unlike all the divisions that we see around us or we, we hear about on the news, whether it's black or white, or rich or poor, or young or old, or male or female, or educated or not educated, the Lord's Supper, which for us is just a very simple, symbolic meal of a bit of bread and a sip from a cup, the Lord's Supper is a reminder that anyone who is in Christ can gather around the same table. We proclaim his body that was sacrificed for us. We proclaim his blood that forgives our sins. And we remember how we deserve the same penalty for our sins. And how we have received his grace. And we have resurrected life instead. So today as we gather around the Lord's table, let's remember this fact. We're not a collection of self-made saints. We are sinners whose only hope is his death, burial, and resurrection. And so because he lives, we live. Because the Father, Son, and Spirit are one, we can be one. So take a look around this room. We have people from different ages, different backgrounds, different ethnic groups, different nationalities, different income levels, different education levels. And it is a testimony to the power of the gospel and the grace of God, which turns enemies into a family. So in our worship, we do this not as a ritual or as a means of receiving God's grace. In communion, we who are in Christ approach the table as a witness that testifies that all barriers between God and man and that all barriers between us as people have been broken down. We don't do this to be made right with God, but it's a celebration of having been made right. It's a celebration of being in a covenant relationship with him. We are no longer strangers. We are no longer without hope. We are no longer far off. In this meal of communion, we look forward with great hope to that eternal communion that we'll share someday Uh, with our Father in heaven. Because Jesus is our peace. So David, if you want to come forward. um, So at EBC here, we, we celebrate what we call an open communion. Meaning you don't have to be a member of our church to do this with us. We invite anybody who calls themselves a believer, who's in Christ to participate with us in this.
And you'll see around the room there are different tables that have some of the different communion elements. In just a moment, I'm going to invite somebody from your group to go off and, and, and grab those for you, um, for your group. Um, but as we do this, we need to prepare our hearts for taking communion together. In 1 Corinthians 11, verse 27 and 28, it says, Whoever therefore eats the bread and drinks of the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and blood of the Lord. So let a person examine himself then, and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. So we need to come together prepared, having searched in our hearts whether or not this is what we should be doing in communion with the Lord. And if we find that we have, there's some unresolved issues or some, some unconfessed sin, we're going to take some, some time in quiet reflection. Think about it. 1 John 1, 9 says that if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Um, so let all of us who are in Christ together uh, prepare to share in the Lord's Supper together. So go ahead and go grab uh, some of the elements from the table. And then let's just take a few minutes of, of personal reflection uh, to prepare for our time together. You know, as I mentioned, the one other time that, that Paul mentions the blood of Christ the way that he did here in Ephesians 2 is in his letter to the Corinthian church. In chapter 10, verse 16, he says, Is not the cup of thanksgiving for which we give thanks a participation in the blood of Christ? And is not the bread that we break a participation in the body of Christ? Because there is one loaf, and we who are many are one body, for we all partake of the one loaf. And later on, in that same book, Paul gives instructions to the church of how they should celebrate. Starting in verse 23, it says, On the night when he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took some bread and gave thanks to God for it. Then he broke it in pieces and said, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Go ahead and take out the wafer and taste of it. Then he goes on to say, in the same way, Jesus. He took the cup of wine after supper, saying, This is my new covenant between God and his people. An agreement confirmed with my blood. Do this to remember me as often as you drink. For every time you eat this bread and drink this cup, you are announcing the Lord's death until he comes again. Father, we thank you so much for who you are and what you have done. God, we don't deserve to be called your children. We don't deserve to be adopted into your family. And God, even as we looked at a few weeks ago, the, we we know the value of something by how much we're willing to pay for it. And you saw value in us by what you were willing to pay. Father, you gave your son. Allowed him to shed his blood and for his body to be broken for us. 
And we thank you for that amazing sacrifice. This act of your grace and mercy toward us. So we, we stand amazed. We stand in awe for the price that you paid. And we thank you. And so, Father, help us not to forget. Help us to remember the sacrifice you made for us. We praise you and we celebrate this. And we thank you for unifying us around this table. And we pray this in the name of our Savior. Amen.